just realized the hardest part about going second is finding a good transition into what you're talking about. <laughs> Two things Jesus said. Don't forbid him for he who is not against us is for us. Also Jesus, he who is not with me is against me, and he who doesn't gather with me scatters. Uh, I was looking at these verses as I came across this article saying, the, the, you know, this point out like supposed contradiction, contradictions in the Bible. Um, for further, further clarity, uh, the first one is in Luke chapter 9, 49 through 50, uh, where John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we forbade him because he doesn't follow with us. He doesn't hang with us. So we told him to stop it. And Jesus said, don't forbid him. For he who is not against us is for us. Uh, it also shows up in Mark. The same story is chapter 9 as well in Mark 38 through 40. Where he said, this time he, he said a bit more. Don't forbid him. For there is no one who will do a mighty work in my name. And be able to quickly speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is on our side. Reiterating the idea that if he's still doing the work, clearly, you know, don't tell him not to just because he ain't, he doesn't ride with us, as it were. But that other bit was in Matthew. Uh, that verse particular, Matt 12, verse 30. Let me get this out. We'll actually go through that one a little bit, kind of point out of this, uh, the alleged contradiction, as it were. Matthew 12, let's start in. We'll just start wherever he picked up. Because this is, uh, this is the bit where they said that he must be casting out demons through Satan. Um, in a denial of the idea of his, his sovereignty, of his uh, deific nature. Uh, start in, we'll start in 25, right off where Jesus starts talking. Uh, knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If by Beelzebub... If I, by Beelzebub, cast out demons, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then God's kingdom has come upon you. Or how can one enter into the house of the strong man and plunder his goods unless he first bind the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me, and he who doesn't gather with me scatters. And he continues on. Now, the bit about this verse is that he is saying that, because it's been brought up, he's doing this through Satan. Jesus is con uh, points out the idea that this is a contradiction, that Satan won't fight against himself in this. The two things that are at odds cannot work together, uh, in so much as... Uh, best example I'd come up with Civil War we had you know the Union and the Confederates that was a house divided and at some point one side had to fall it, it, it had to be one or the other um, to kind of to reiterate you know a house divided itself will not stand you know the had to go one way or the other <clears throat> reiterating also I also like that he kind of points out to them, like, you guys are saying this because you're in denial here, but the issue is if I'm doing it through Beelzebub, then who are your people, who are your generations casting out demons? When you guys do cast out demons, who are you using? Now it's all up for, you know, if, if you can cast out demons by demons, then how can you be sure that you yourself are not also using the God of, are using the God of power or not also unwittingly using demons? but kind of points out the fact that 
if I'm doing it by God, you know the kingdom's upon you and you're in denial. He's kind of pointing that out to them, that little discrepancy in there. But again, he's talking about when he says in 30, he who is not with me is against me and he who doesn't gather with me scatters. The idea is opposing forces won't work together. They can't work together. I can't do this by Satan because it's not how that works. Meanwhile, in the other verses, when he says that, you know, don't forbid him for he who is not against us is for us. It's a different scenario because there he's saying this guy's already on our side just because he doesn't sit with us. The It'd be the same as united and living saying we're not going to sit together. Imagine that. <laughs> um, you know, it's the same plight that we kind of have these days of these these groups that kind of point fingers at the others and in in broad sense uh, and the, the 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 most blatant example of that, of course, being Philadelphia and the idea of all oh, you guys are wrong. We're going to sit over here and you're not allowed to sit with us. Where. Many of the other larger big churches still hold that attitude, regardless of whether or not there is direct as the Philadelphian organization. But at the end of the day, aren't we all Christian? Aren't we already on the same side, despite the attitude? As Christ said, we're on the same side. Let's not argue with the guy. So at that point, you have to ask, what is it? to be Christian um, in its simplest form is someone who believes in Christ in that way all of the churches CGI Living, United, Philadelphia are all united in that one belief uh, just as we are united with the Baptists and the Roman Catholics in that one belief we have to assume that we are at that point all on the same side you know, there's always that, that kind of point of that you hear it come up every so often. You know, there's some people that have no idea about the Word of God, but still act like better Christians than some Christians. It's um, it's a kind of mentality that begins to diminish the word Christian, in so much as that that core belief in Christ is what requires you to be Christian. Um, to reference C.S. Lewis in his book *Mere Christianity*, he brings up that point in that it begins to be a uh, a point in where Christian would become like the word gentleman. At one point in time, gentleman meant that you had a coat of arms and owned land uh, with an estate on it. And it was very simple. You could call a man a liar and a gentleman, and it wasn't a contradiction. Whereas now, we have this mentality of, oh, he's acting like a gentleman, how he ought to act, not necessarily, you know, you can be, these days, you can be a gentleman without a coat of arms or without any property to your name which diminishes the word gentleman and becomes very subjective as to whether or not you think that person is a gentleman or not. Whereas if we were to begin to describe people as Christian to say that we think they are a good person, it wouldn't add anything to the English language since we already have the word good. Um, to borrow from, uh, from him on that. So we have to assume at that point that we are all on the same side when we are dealing with even people out there keeping Sunday. Granted, some of them may actively tell people not to to keep the Sabbath. That you know, we're trying to fool them, or they kind of you know, they there's that that spectrum of we're trying to fool them, or the, at the other end of the spectrum, they kind of let us be. And I, I want to go ahead and read out of, I want to read out of the book a little bit because there's a metaphor that I really like that he uses when he's talking about this sort of antagonism between the, the sex, as it were. Let's see, I'm going to start. No spoilers, it's in the foreword, so it's in the very beginning of the book. <laughs> Let's see. When he talks about the idea of mere Christianity, the idea of it being boiled down to its its coarsest principles versus the the minutiae of every different uh, sector denomination. 
he compares it to he compares it, the whole thing to a house. He said it is more like Christianity in itself is more like a hall out of which doors open into several rooms. If I can bring anyone into that hall, I shall have done what I have attempted, in so much as that convincing someone that Christianity is the way to go. It's just so long as he can bring them into the hall. But it is in the rooms, not in the hall, that there are fires and chairs and meals. The rooms here being the different denominations and sects. The hall is a place to wait in, a place from which to try the various doors, but not a place to live in. For that purpose, the worst of the rooms, whichever that may be, is, I think, preferable. It is true that some people may find they have to wait in the hall for a considerable time, while others feel certain almost at once which door they must knock at. I do not know why there is this difference, but I am sure God keeps no one waiting unless he sees that it is good for him to wait. When you do get into your room, you will find that the long wait has done you some kind of good, which you would not have had otherwise. But you must regard it as waiting, not as camping. You must keep on praying for light, and of course, even in the hall, you must begin trying to obey the rules which are common to the whole house. And above you must, and above all, you must be asking which door is the true one, not which pleases you by, best by its paint and paneling. In plain language, the question should never be, do I like that kind of service? But are these doctrines true? Is holiness here? Does my conscience move me towards this? Is my reluctance to knock at this door due to my pride or my mere taste or my personal dislike of this particular doorkeeper? When you have reached your own room, be kind to those who have chosen different doors and to those who are still in the hall. If they are wrong, they need your prayers all the more. And if they are your enemies, then you are under orders to pray for them. That is one of the rules common to the whole house. So, of course, referencing there at the end to the, the scripture where Jesus said, pray for your enemies. We tend to have this very, this antagonistic us versus them mentality of the people out in the world. But as we kind of get closer and further on, we, we begin to see that there's more at stake and more often or not, we're more in common with them. You know, as you read prophecy, sometimes, you know, there's, you know, or is it the, the atheists that are going to take over and cause everything to go to, to, to down the hole? Or is it, you know, the, the Muslims that are going to cause it all to go down the hole? And, you know, people who, when I first got to the church, because of what they were teaching, that the Roman Catholic Church was going to be the one that took over everything, you know, I thought it was the people right next to me that were going to do it, that were going to take over uh, and be the enemy. And then as those are probably going to end up being our allies in the darkest times in a world that is either godless or you know falsely following unchristian tenets at the end of the day because even catholicism at this point in time doesn't believe in executions anymore in beheadings just because you disagree but even at the same time to expand that metaphor out of the hall the hall is any weight. The hall is any length of time that you're still in development, that you're still learning. How many of us have, have even looked, you know, we go to the feast, there's a lot of people there, but, we, you know, we tend to look at, you look at certain people and you kind of go, man, I wish they were further along. Uh, is a nice way of putting it sometimes. Because um, I can think of a few people where I'm just like, why are you still acting like this? But again, to mirror what C.S. Lewis was saying in there, there's no reason to resent anyone for the time spent in the hall, regardless of whether or not it's deciding on a, a, a denomination, as he was talking about, or whether or not it's just growing into the church as a whole, growing into your gifts, growing into the Christian attitude of finally entering the room and committing yourself to, to living there. You know, the, uh, the argument of Christian as a objective word I believe in Christ versus Christian as the subjective good person who follows a certain subset of rules inadvertently or not begins to bring up the idea of a, almost like a, a point system because I've done this good deed today I've racked up points and even if I don't adhere to the point system somehow I'm still racking up points just fewer than someone who might be showing up every day or praying every morning 
But at the end of the day, it's that declaration of what side in the game you're going to play that puts you in the house at all, that begins to develop you towards entering the room and, and growing in that spirit and that devotion. You know, Court was talking about that. You know, we all spend that, that time where we kind of know and then suddenly very much believe uh, more than we ever could and far more than we sometimes want to in that moment for the, that gush of, of guilt uh, and awareness of our, of our frailty and our futility. And one could only hope that we didn't have people staring down our necks, resenting us for having not reached that point yet. Because I think the only person who got down here and was already at that point from the get-go was Christ himself. And the only one who has any reason to resent us, and yet, to reference, while we were still enemies, he still loved us. When he had no reason to. When he had every reason to resent us. <clears throat> 